Hello everyone, I'm Jenny Eckhol, I'm part of the PacBio uh, Pac team. I want to welcome everyone to the PacBio webinar series uh, with today, today's topic focused on unlocking the genome with long read sequencing in genetic research. I'm joined here today by two members, uh, or two scientists, that uh, will present in the following order. Tichelle Turner is first up. Uh, she's assistant professor at Washington University School of Medicine. And she's followed by Christine Liu, a PhD candidate from uh, University of California, San Diego. So we have a lot of material to cover today. And um, the presentations portion of the webinar will be followed by a questions and answers session. Uh, you're welcome to submit your questions at any point during the webinar by typing them in the area provided on your attendee control panel, and we will get to them at the end. We will also be recording this webinar and making it available for download in the next few days. So keep an eye out for the follow-up email with the link to the recording. So with that, let's get started. Um, welcome to Shell. Thank you for the opportunity to come here today to talk about long read sequencing as part of the pathway to precision genomics for precision medicine. So in my lab, we are very interested in using genomics to solve both rare and common disease. So here is a typical genomic workflow, starting first at the hospital or clinic, going through biospecimen collection, sequencing, variants and interpretation, and ultimately linking back to the hospital and clinic. In my lab, we are very interested in autism and other neurodevelopmental disorders. So in the past year, my lab has been publishing quite a few papers on this topic of precision genomics. And as we began to publish in this area, we were asked by reviewers and editors to define the term. So we define this as determining all possible relevant genomic variation within an individual to the precise nucleotide. And this term was very much inspired by precision medicine, which was defined by President Barack Obama as healthcare tailored to you with a mission statement to enable a new era of medicine through research technology and policies that empower patients, researchers, and providers to work together towards development of individualized care. So in this manner, we think of precision genomics as a subset of precision medicine. So my dream would be that one day when we go to our yearly doctor visit, at the beginning of the visit, there would be biospecimen collection, and by the end of the visit, our doctor would have our genome in hand and be able to use that genome to guide our healthcare. But what are the current limitations to this idea of precision genomics for precision medicine in everyone? Well, there are very, there are very many, actually. And the first would be variants missed due to genomic technology. Another would be interpretation of non-coding variation, which remains difficult. Another would be the speed of the current genomic workflow. Although incredible advances have been made recently, but we still have a lot more to do in this area to improve to this kind of one hour workup. We have to better understand at an individual, individual level how the combination of multi-hit rare and or common variants work together. And we also have to understand gene by environment. So these are five areas that my lab is very interested in working on at this point, and I'm sure you can think of many others. But today I'm going to focus on just one, and that is variants missed due to genomic technology. So if we jump back to this genomic workflow, we can see that at the bottom of the sequencing part of the diagram, there are short reads, and they are really the current state of the art for large scale assessment. And in my own work, I've looked at tens of thousands of individuals with this technology. But today I wanna to talk about what I think is the present in the very near future, which is long read sequencing. And this, for this, we've looked at 78 individuals. And I wanna point out right now that when I'm talking about long reads today, I'm talking about highly accurate PacBio HiFi data. So we got our first PacBio data a, a little over a year ago. And when we got the data, we had to develop a bioinformatic workflow to process the data. So what we did was we integrated both case data as well as control data, which will be very important as I'll discuss in a moment. And we built a workflow to look at de novo assemblies, which is a big benefit of having long read sequencing data. And then we built a more traditional workflow, which is a reference-based approach, much more like what you would typically do with short reads. 
So the first thing that we looked at in the data was a comparison of an individual that we had sequenced with both technologies, Illumina short reads and PacBio long reads. And what we saw that overall, there was a really good TITV ratio indicating that the variants were very good. Um, but the big difference was that we were able to identify more indels with the PacBio data, and in particular, a different range of sizes, which had been missed with the short read data. So the first thing that we saw in one of the individuals with autism in our research study was this variant, and it's a CGG expansion in the FMR1 gene. It was scored as pathogenic. It was not in control variant databases built on short read data. But actually, I know quite a bit about this gene, and I realized right away that that was probably not the relevant variant in this individual. So we gathered all of the publicly available PacBio long read data that we could find from control individuals, and we pulled data from the Pan Genome Project, and we found this allele is actually at a allele frequency of 27.6% in controls. This is really indicating the critical need for additional long read sequencing in control individuals. Long read sequencing is also enabling us to phase genomic variation. And by that, I just mean that we can say that this A and G are together on this chromosome, and this G and T are together on this chromosome. And standard short read data does not enable you to do this very well. But it is very critical when you're looking at things like compound heterozygotes and autosomal recessive genes. Today, I'm not going to show you all of the empirical data. I just want to let you know that 99% of variants are phaseable with long read data, and they are phaseable into large genomic blocks like this one. So this is a 126 kilobase pair region that covers the PAH gene, and this is the phase block from long read sequencing, so it's very large. And these are the phase blocks that we get when we look at the short read data, so very, very small. So you can see that with the long reads, we can nicely assign the reads to the haplotype 1 and haplotype 2. So for example, if these two variants were critical in this individual in our study, then it would be very beneficial to know that they are both on different haplotypes. The last point that I want to touch on generally about long read sequencing is that we can now do de novo assemblies. So if you think back to the original Human Genome Project, it took many years and a lot of money and a lot of labs, but now you can build a actual de novo assembly from an individual in your research study in just one day in the lab. It's pretty amazing. What we looked at was actually how much data we needed to generate to get a good assembly. And we saw that overall coverage tracks well with the number of smart cells. The number of smart cells uh, is basically the unit of sequencing that we have on a long read sequencer. And you can see that we can get a 20x genome with just two smart cells. We've explored several different assemblers. I'm just going to show one today. This is um, on an individual that we sequenced all the way out to about 46-fold coverage. You can see this is 46, 35, 24, and 11. And we saw that, that we really got a good assembly starting around the 20X genome, the two smart cells. So this is the NG50 value, which if you don't know what that is, that's the value at which 50% of the contigs are at that size or larger. So in this particular assembly, the NG50 was 46.4 megabase pairs, which is really astonishing. It's quite, it's quite nice. So in my lab, we have now applied long read sequencing to two different neurodevelopmental disorders. The first is 9P minus syndrome. And 9P minus syndrome is very rare, and it involves deletion somewhere on the P arm of chromosome 9. Now, the phenotypes are incredibly variable in individuals, but there is one shared phenotype of developmental delay, and this is shown in the table here. Now, traditionally, diagnosis has been performed using a karyotype or a chromosome microarray, and these are several of the variants that are published in the literature, deletions, and sometimes deletions and duplications in individuals with 9P minus syndrome. To complicate things, though, 50% of the time, individuals with 9P minus syndrome also have a translocation of a piece of DNA from another chromosome. So we think that with all this information, that long read sequencing would really be ideal for precision genomics in 9P minus syndrome, because we can detect the precise variant breakpoints, we can look at variants on the remaining allele, and we can also look at variants around the rest of the genome. 
So Washington University in St. Louis is the official research partner of the Chromosome 9P network cohort. And this network started in 1984 with just one family and has now grown to over 800 families. This is a global network. So this is a, a, an analysis we did in our recent paper. And in each of the blue countries is where we have individuals in the 9P network cohort. So you can see 9P minus syndrome affects people around the world on nearly every continent. So we were able to recently look at this data. So we had karyotype level data in 719 individuals from this cohort. So this is a large number of samples, but um, not a very high resolution genomic data point. But we could begin to get a little bit of a survey of where the deletion breakpoints were. And we saw that the greatest number of breakpoints were on 9P24 out near the telomere. The next were in 9P22, and the least were near the centromere over here. Very few individuals have breakpoints that go to that region. Furthermore, we could begin to characterize the involvement of other chromosomes. We hypothesized there could be actually a preference of one chromosome over others, but that's not the case. In fact, many different chromosome arms are involved in translocations. The highest actually involve 9Q, either a piece of 9Q has moved to 9P, or there are ring chromosome nines followed by 8Q. But as you can see, overall, there's no overwhelming trend for one particular chromosome. So we then moved in this study to the other extreme, which was precision genomics. So high resolution genomic data on one individual. And I'm going to give you the answer at the beginning. So this individual has an entire chromosome 14 that is attached to a chromosome nine that has a small deletion followed by a diploid segment where one piece of the, one of the copies has moved to the X chromosome, followed by a large deletion, followed by a mosaic duplication, and the remainder of chromosome nine is diploid. So how did we get to this answer? Well, first we assessed estimated copy number from the read depth information, and we saw there was a large deletion, mosaic duplication, and then the rest was diploid. But as we began to look at the data more, we realized there was this interesting peak out near the telomere. So we explored this further. And when we did so, we realized that the estimated copy number was two. And it was essentially diploid in this one segment. And then it's a de small deletion here and a, the beginning of the larger deletion here. Well, we tried to figure out where was this piece coming from or how did this all fit? And so we did a de novo assembly using the long read data. And by doing so, we identified that this piece of chromosome nine had actually moved, one of the copies had moved to the X chromosome in this orientation as shown. And this was only found by doing long read sequencing. We've now done PacBio on another 11 individuals with 9P minus syndrome, and we have identified one region that's shared by most individuals, and the genes in that region are shown here. This is also a region on 9P24, which was indicated by the karyotype level data. We also are doing precision genomics in these individuals, and you can see three of these individuals actually have complex variation. So while karyotype and array, as I mentioned, have solved some of the variation, long read set sequencing was actually critical to uncover the full precision genomics workups in these individuals. So now I'm going to switch to our study on autism, for which we received a SMART grant from PacBio. So we had proposed to study a family that had autism, epilepsy, and craniofacial dysmorphisms in two affected girls. And in this family, they had gone undergone testing in the clinic, and they had no answers. So we enrolled them in our research study, and we did PacBio long read sequencing, bio nanogenome imaging, and 10x genomics. And the long read sequencing was critical to understanding this family. The first thing that I want to mention, though, was that we looked at de novo assemblies, we looked at structural variants, we looked at all of the really tricky variation that you might um, expect in a, in a family where there had been no answers, and we didn't really find any variation that really explained what was going on in the family. So at that point, we turned to the short variant data, and we identified this de novo missense mutation in both of the affected children. We identified this by using the exomizer program in the genomizer form, to, because it's genome data, and we saw that this had a very high score for the exomizer program, a high phenotype score, and a high variant score. 
It was predicted to be damaging by all the different in silico programs that we used. The variant was not present in public databases, was also not present in control data that we used from long read sequencing. Now, the amino acid itself was completely conserved across 100 vertebrates, and the nucleotide itself was conserved across 100 vertebrates, and it's in the top 0.05% conserved bases in the entire human genome. So we thought this was quite interesting, and we began to look at the read data, and we saw that when we looked at the read data, which are nicely phased to their haplotypes, that in both of the affected individuals, this was on the blue chromosome, we then looked at the PacBio data further and used the phasing information to actually determine more about the variant. So the first thing we did was to look for an inherited phase informative SNP, and we found one 4,880 base pairs away. This was the nearest phase informative variant and would have not been detectable with short read data. And what we did then was to look at what chromosome that variant was on in relation to the de novo variant. And it turns out it was on the same chromosome. And this blue chromosome was inherited from the father, suggesting this is a germline mosaic. And now remember, the two girls are not monozygotic twins. So this is a probably a germline mosaic event. We furthermore did Sanger sequencing to confirm the de novo status of the variant, as you can see here. And then we began to explore the variant itself. So the variant was a valine to alanine change, a residue 473 of this KCNC2 gene, which encodes the KV3.2 protein. And if you make your students memorize their amino acids like I do, then you would think that's probably not a very big change. However, it's in a very interesting location in the protein. So I began reading papers about valine to alanine changes in different potassium channels, and I came across this paper by Peters et al. And this sequence looked incredibly familiar to me. So this is actually the Drosophila ortholog of our protein called Shaker, and a human paralog of our protein called KV1.1. And in this study, they were studying this valine to alanine change that was involved in a syndrome called episodic ataxia and my myokymia syndrome which this variant was tracking with that phenotype in this family, in this KV1.1 protein. And you'll notice that that mutation is at a very familiar position in relation to the protein that we're studying. So we then lined up the sequence and saw that actually it's the same position and the same amino acid change. So for the first time in my life, I think someone had already done functional assessment of the exact mutation that I was interested in. And just to convince you formally that this is very conserved, this is the formal alignment of the shaker with our particular KV3.2 channel. So this mutation accelerates the current decay of the channel in, in both the Drosophila and human, and also in the human paralog. It shifts the voltage dependence of activation of the channel, and ultimately it causes the channel to have short bursts instead of entering a long-lasting open state. Once we knew all this information, we looked for additional individuals with neurodevelopmental disorders with mutations in this gene. And we identified seven additional individuals as shown here, with the majority of those in the S6 transmembrane domain. The gene itself is most highly expressed in the brain. And when looking across the developing human brain, it's most highly expressed after birth and most highly expressed in the thalamus. And in particular, when we look at single cell data, we find that it's a very highly expressed gene in the GABAergic neurons in the cortex and hippocampus. So hopefully today I have um, shown you how long read sequencing is really ushering in kind of this new era in human genomics. I've showed this to you in the setting of two research projects and how we've been able to identify new variants and all of the different things that we can do with the long read data. We actually found that having reference-based approach in the case of the family was really critical, and the assembly-based approach was really critical in 9P minus syndrome. We also would ask that more long read sequencing is done on control genomes to help with frequency filtering in the future. And so today I've shown you the example of precision genomics, ultimately going toward the goal of precision medicine in 9P minus syndrome and autism. Thank you. Well, while we wait for Christine, maybe I can ask you one quick question to show that the audience has uh, already submitted. Um, 
one question is um, the analysis. So basically, how different is the long read sequencing analysis compared to short read sequencing analysis? Yeah, so the actual analysis itself, if you do the reference based approach, it's not that different. Um, it's just a few different tools that you would swap in. Um, the de novo assembly is a little bit trickier and there's sort of new tools you have to familiarize yourself with plus a little bit of custom code. But if you want to just jump right in, you can start with the reference based approach. Okay. Another question is how rep reproducible is precision genomics, long read genomics as reading uh, the same sample many times? Um, Okay, so in terms of reading the same sample many times for short reads, I'm guessing I guess can you can you probably, um, yeah, maybe maybe that's what they're they're getting at. Are you getting the same results? What's the consensus between the two different the two different technology types? Yeah, that would be so. My yeah, it's really high. Um, I think the one noticeable piece that you'll find is that you'll find a lot more of the small indels um, with the PacBio data than you will with the short read data. So those indels in the range of 50 base pairs to 1,000 base pairs are much easier to find in the PacBio data. But then the caveat there is what I mentioned, there aren't so many control genomes, so you have to be careful if you're trying to filter those for your study. Um, with short read based variant databases. But overall, they're pretty consistent. Okay. Well, I see Christine is back online, so I'll hand the mic back to you. Okay. Sorry about all the technical difficulties. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Christine Mu, and I am a graduate student in Gerald Chun's lab um, at the University of California, San Diego. Um, we're going to kind of shift gears a little um, and talk about RNA um, instead of DNA right now. Um, and I'll be sharing a portion of a project that we recently published in PNAS. Um, and this is exploring cell type um, specific RNA isoform diversity in the Down syndrome brain. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so to just start out with a kind of brief introduction of what we did. Um, we basically wanted to survey the whole transcriptome of Down syndrome brains um, compared to control uh, quote unquote normal brains um, across uh, different stages of aging. And so what we did was we took 29 uh, Down syndrome and control age match brains across different ages. So we had a young group, we had a kind of middle aged group um, and then we had an older group um, just to see what the transcriptome looks across looks like across time. Um, we took the prefrontal cortex of our postmortem human brain samples, isolated nuclei using the 10x chromium, and then split the sequencing libraries between Illumina short read sequencing and PacBio long read sequencing. Um, I think a lot of people here are probably familiar with uh, PacBio's technologies, um, but for those who aren't, um, we used PacBio's IsoSeq technology, which is their RNA sequencing, um, and that allows us to get read lengths of about 10 to 10 to 15 KB, um, which is really great for resolving the full length of a cDNA and has, has huge advantages um, over using Illumina short read technologies for RNA sequencing. Um, the short reads can only capture um, 100 to 200 base pairs, which is likely to only sequence a single exon or um, a single exon junction. And the long reads allow you to see which exons are spliced together and in which combination. Um, we used our Illumina short read sequencing data from our samples uh, for um, cell type identification and a differential gene expression, so comparing within a particular cell type, what the transcriptome in Down syndrome looked like compared to control. Um, and we were able to discover a lot of really interesting biology, which unfortunately I won't be able to cover today uh, because I'll be focusing uh, primarily on our PacBio long read data. Um, so of course we used this for isoform characterization in our different samples. Um, and what 
allowed us to, to be able to do this at a single cell resolution um, was that splitting the libraries meant that um, the reads had matching barcodes. So we were able to take a transcript, um, look at the barcode that was attached to it and match it back to the cell type of origin. Um, and that allows us to assign particular isoforms to particular cells and particular cell types. Um, next slide, please. So we can kind of divide um, what we did with the long read uh, data into three areas of discovery. Um, and I'm going to start off with isoform diversity. Um, next slide. Oh, and then one after that. <laughs> so after there's a whole bioinformatics process to analyzing the raw data that comes from an isoseq um, experiment um, down to figuring out what the different isoforms are. And one of the tools that we used is called Sconti2. Um, and this is created and maintained by the Conessa lab. Um, and basically what it does is it takes our QC'd and, and mapped isoforms and categorizes it into these um, different categories. Uh, for the purposes of my talk today, I'm going to be focusing mainly on four categories, the full splice match or FSM, incomplete splice match, ISM, novel in catalog NIC, and novel not in catalog NNC isoforms. And the main um, distinction between these categories is whether they're known or they match the reference annotation of all the different transcripts. Um, or if they're novel, meaning that they haven't been reported and aren't part of that reference annotation. So the full splice and incomplete splice matches are your known isoforms. Um, and as the names suggest, they either match um, an isoform in the reference annotation completely or fully, or um, they match a reference partially, um, res likely resulting from some sort of truncation um, or fragmentation during the, the isolation or library preparation process. Um, what's particularly interesting, I think, is the novel isoforms. Um, so the novel in catalog and novel not in catalog isoforms, um, which differ from the reference uh, annotation. And so novel in catalog isoforms are novel because they have known splice sites, um, but maybe in a novel combination that hasn't been reported before. And then novel not in catalog isoforms have at least one novel splice site that differentiates them from the reference annotation. Um, next slide, please. So what we did here um, to start with, um, if you're looking, if you look at the, the Venn diagrams on the left, is we kind of did a general comparison of the isoforms that were observed in Down syndrome and in control. And we wanted to see um, is there any overlap generally of which isoforms were expressed. And we, we separated out um, between the FSM, NIC, and NNC um, isoforms. And you can see that there's a really big overlap um, in the FSM isoforms and maybe less overlap um, in our novel isoforms. And I think what this um, does is it really highlights that we're getting a lot of diversity. We're picking up a lot of isoforms um, that are in the reference annotation um, as well as novel isoforms that haven't been seen before. And seeing an overlap between the Down syndrome and control, particularly in the novel isoforms, gives us some reassurance that these isoforms are, are real and they're just, um, they're, not, they're not created as an artifact because they're seen in um, multiple different samples. Um, we wanted to look at these, uh, so turning your attention to the middle plots, uh, we wanted to look at the distribution of um, isoforms that were novel. So the fraction of total isoforms that were categorized as in catalog or novel not in catalog um, across the different age groups, so young and old, um, and across the different uh, sample groups as well, control and disease. And we split them up as well with the, the different cell types. So there's a lot of little different layers here. Um, and, and generally looking at this, nothing really stands out as striking or anything um, to variable across the different groups. But if you hone in onto looking at uh, variation between different cell types, um, looking at the plots on the right, you can see that certain cell types express a higher proportion of novel isoforms um, compared to others. So you can see here 
uh, for example, that astrocytes and excitatory neurons um, express a higher fraction um, of novel in catalog and novel not in catalog isoforms than um, the other cell types in the brain. Next slide, please. We also wanted to look at cell type specific um, differential transcript expression and differential isoform usage or um, isoform switching, which is this idea that if you're comparing between two different groups, um, one group will predominantly express a transcript that's different from the predominant transcript in the other group. So again, we started just by generally comparing Down syndrome and control um, in this top left uh, plot and didn't really see a, a whole lot of changes um, in terms of uh, transcript expression or isoform usage. However, when we did pairwise comparisons um, of different cell types, so in the top right, we're showing um, the comparison of excitatory neurons and oligodendrocytes, you can actually start seeing some differential transcript expression as seen by the log-twofold log change along the x-axis here. Um, and then some isoform switching as well. Um, two examples that we pulled out in the bottom two graphs, which showed the proportion of reads um, from, a from each cell type that were attributed to a particular isoform. Um, you can see with CLTB, the excitatory and inhibitory neurons uh, predominantly express this purple isoform, while oligodendrocytes predominantly express this blue isoform instead. Um, and that's considered to be isoform switching. Um, you can see a very similar pattern with BIN1, where the excitatory and inhibitory neurons are expressing uh, a different predominant transcript than the other cell types or the other non neuronal cell types. Next slide, please. Okay, so the next thing that we looked at um, was picking out novel isoform features or reasons why these isoforms were considered to be novel. Um, in comparison to the reference annotation. Next slide. So novel not in catalog isoforms um, are generally defined as having a novel splice site. And there's a bunch of different features that create these novel splice sites um, that I guess make these isoforms novel compared to the reference annotation. And so as we were just looking through all our data, uh, we noticed three different features um, that came up fairly frequently um, in the different novel, non canonical, novel, not in catalog isoforms. And so one of these features was novel exons, or basically um, exonic uh, sequence uh, that doesn't overlap any currently known um, exon in the reference annotation. Uh, we saw intra exonic junctions. Uh, which basically are two novel splice sites in the middle of exons um, that join them together. Um, they don't have to occur in adjacent exons and they can um, splice out quite a bit of uh, information in the middle um, if they are uh, distal exons. And we also saw partially retained introns. So we did use nuclei instead of cells uh, because we were working with brain tissue. And for that reason, we were kind of expecting to see some level of intronic retention um, just because nuclei contain pre-spliced pre mRNA and also M spliced mRNA. Um, but we also saw what seems to be um, kind of an extension of exons into the intronic space. So the exon is a little longer um, and has a different end site um, due to partially retaining some intronic sequence. Um, next slide, please. So the last, the last thing that we did with this data uh, was to try to do some long read only cell type identification. Um, and basically the idea here was that um, there's a certain amount of information you can get from the short read, which really allows you to do this cell type differentiation um, and, and labeling. Um, but long read theoretically gives you the same type of information because you can see which genes are expressed. Um, in addition to giving you isoform information as well. So we wanted to know if there was a way to bypass using short read sequencing data and focus all of our efforts um, and costs on uh, long read sequencing. Next slide, please. Um, and so, so basically what we did here, which was kind of a proof of concept, 
um, was to create a gene cell counts matrix from our isoform information. So we summed all the read counts of the different isoforms um, from the same gene um, and used this gene cell counts matrix to cluster cells and identify cell types. So uh, a gene cell counts matrix is kind of your standard input for a short read single cell sequencing um, experiment to identify uh, the different cell types. Um, next slide, please. And the main thing that we run into here um, when comparing between short read and long read is that there's a really big difference in read depth. Um, on the left here is a knee plot uh, from Cell Ranger, which is the first tool in QCing short read sequencing data for single cell analysis. Um, and what this shows is the cumulative number of barcodes that have at least a certain number of UMI or unique molecular identifier counts. And these unique molecular identifiers just indicate the number of reads that were um, identified to be from each cell. And so you'll notice here that there's a divide uh, between uh, calling certain barcodes as being real cells versus background. Um, and this is just to avoid analyzing any like ambient RNA that got picked up during the process. Um, and you'll see here that cells tend to have thousands to ten thousands of reads. Uh, I plotted the long read data um, on the right in a similar way, um, where the red line indicates a 50 UMI cutoff and the green line indicates 100. And so you can see that there's a really uh, a pretty big difference in the number of reads we're getting per cell um, from long read, just because it's not nearly as high throughput as the short read process. Uh, next slide. Nevertheless, we went ahead and used a cutoff of 50 UMIs per cell um, and clustered and identified the different cell types and labeled them accordingly. And we actually got 72% um, accuracy of the general cell type, which is, I thought was really surprising personally and is, is not actually too bad. Um, if you look at the left plot here, it's a UMAP um, that shows, or UMAP, sorry, from short read sequencing um, it's it's beautiful. It has it shows really great separation um, and grouping of the different cell types, um, which is kind of what something that you would expect um, from this type of data. Uh, the right plots are the UMAPs for the long read data in the middle, colored by cell type, and on the right, um, colored by whether that cell type was correct or incorrect. Um, the reason we're able to to know whether our cell type prediction was correct or incorrect is because um, again, the, the barcodes matched between the short read and the long read, so we're able to compare the cell type assignment for a particular barcode um, in the short read as well as the long read. And so you can see there's not nearly as uh, clean of a separation or uh, definitive grouping. However, I, would, I was pretty pleased. I think that 72% accuracy um, it speaks a little bit to how the cell type markers are, are probably really highly expressed and pretty well established for each of these cell types. But I think also shows that there's a lot of potential for, um, for using long reads um, to identify cell types and um, cell type specific isoform expression as well. Um, next slide, please. So to just kind of sum up our conclusions from the long read uh, portion of this paper and kind of point in some future directions, uh, we did see a large number of unannotated and novel isoforms expressed in the brain. Um, and I think this, this really highlights how cool the isoseq technology is, um, that we're able to see things that exist in biology um, and I guess in real life, um, but haven't really been reported yet. Um, we saw that isoform expression varies between different cell types, whether that's on the isoform switching level or the fact that um, certain cell types tend to express more novel isoforms, um, I guess, that haven't been really sampled before. Um, and I think this really points at the potential for cell type definition and identification to include isoform expression. So currently, cell types are defined uh, mostly by morphology or gene expression. Um, and with the technology that's advancing now and that we I kind of currently have right now, I think there's no reason why we wouldn't extend that definition to also include isoform definition, especially since we've seen it vary uh, between different cell types. 
And then we also saw that long read only analysis is there's definitely great potential for it, but it could definitely benefit from increased read depth. Um, and luckily for us that there are already steps in the right direction for that. Um, PacBio uh, recently has, um, I guess, explored the use of this technique called MOS isoseq, uh, which improves the uh, throughput of long read sequencing 10 to 20 times, uh, which is definitely a great step forward in terms of increasing the read depth across different cell types. Um, and there are also a lot of different targeted approaches you could use to specifically amplify um, isoforms of interest as well. Um, so that's definite. There's a lot of a lot of potential there, and a lot of ways that we can improve upon and continue moving forward with isoform uh, discovery. Um, next slide, please. I think we should be starting questions soon, but I just wanted to end with some quick acknowledgements because none of this work was uh, done by me solely. Um, I'd like to thank my PI, Gerald. Um, and in particular, I'd like to thank Carter Palmer, who is a fellow graduate student in the lab, and he and I worked very closely together on this project. Um, and then I'd also like to thank uh, William Romanow, who is a staff scientist that supported this paper as well. Um, um, I'd like to thank the rest of the Chen Lab um, because it's a really fun place to work. Um, and then all of our different funding sources, um, as well as in particular, the donors and families who shared brain materials. Um, and yeah, I think that wraps up everything and I can definitely take questions uh, along with Tishel. Thank you so much. Let me um, get situated here. Right. Tichelle, if you are able to turn on the camera, uh, oh, there you are. <laughs> All right, so let's start with some uh, questions. Thank you again for, for the talks. They were absolutely wonderful, despite any technical issues. Um, I'm going to start with a question to Tichelle. To um, this is, um, I'm guessing, referring to either one of your projects. Um, could the current gene editing tools correct these errors? Um, I guess for the autism or the 9P minus syndrome? Oh, um, that's an interesting question for gene editing for 9P minus might be very difficult with some of the complex variation that we've seen. Um, but for the single base pair changes, I think that potentially could be done. But actually in the case of the potassium channel, we're looking at other kind of therapeutics um, potentially in, in that particular case. I think it would be very hard in 9P minus, so. Yeah, thank you. Christine, um, how do you transition from uh, the 10X workflow into the PAC bio sequencing for single cell? Um, so the bioinformatics analysis is pretty separate um, in terms of like the the things that came directly from the normal 10x protocol into short read sequencing. Uh, we sequenced or we we analyzed through like the typical uh, cell ranger package from 10x, um, and then through uh, we used Surat, which is one of the really common and highly cited single cell short read analysis packages. In terms of long read. Um, at the time when I did the analysis, there was a there were some recommendations and guidelines um, on PacBio's uh, tools tool pages, um, particularly the GitHub repository uh, cup cDNA cupcake that's maintained by Liz Sang. Um, right now, actually, single cell has been really built out. So there's um, demultiplexing uh, through IsoSeq three, um, and then a bunch of different tools that can handle that type of demultiplexing and matching back to barcodes now. Yeah. And uh, on the lab side, you can uh, you can um, you can uh, use any single cell library that is full length represents full length isoform. So it can be it can be sequenced on the pack via instrument. Um to shell, um, so with the recent news of the telomere to telomere uh, consortium's efforts coming to a conclusion. Now we have a complete uh, uh, human reference genome. 
how do you see this playing in to your research in the future? Yeah, uh, well, that's a good question. In the paper on 9P minus syndrome for the first individual, we actually use the T to T reference as well to um, to check if the coordinates and things had changed. And while the coordinates had slightly changed, the interpretation was still the same for that individual. Um, but yeah, we basically started remapping all of our data to that genome as well. I think that will be a pretty uh, standard reference that people will want to use for their studies in addition probably to 38, Bill 38. Yeah, it's very cool. <laughs> um, Christine, when you say PathBio is not high throughput, not as high throughput as short read, do you mean it detects less UMIs per cell? Um, I guess that's one question. And then when one detects, say, thousands of genes per cell in the standard 10x short uh, read workflow, how many genes per cell can one detect in long read format? Um, so I guess to answer that first question, yeah, we're definitely getting uh, fewer UMIs. Um, and those were the differences between the new plots. So in short read, we're getting thousands to tens of thousands of UMIs per cell versus in um, long read, we're getting maybe hundreds. Um, I guess too, if you're just considering the technologies, a typical Illumina sequencing run is getting hundreds of millions of reads per sample or per lane. Um, while PacBio, um, you're capped out at 8 million smart well or ZMWs um, on a smart cell, uh, which with like P1s of about 70 is maybe around five and a half to six million reads. And then of course, QCing. Um, so yeah, we're getting fewer UMIs per cell. Um, and for the second question, can you repeat that? <laughs> yes. Um... When one says, uh, when one detects, say, 1,000 genes per cell in the standard 10x short read workflow, how many genes per cell can you detect in a long read format? It's just basically getting a sense of how much less it is. Oh, OK. So for genes, you're getting like tens of thousands of genes um, per cell, of course, when you're getting like that many UMIs. Um, but for long read, I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head. but you're definitely getting, again, more in the hundreds. So often you're getting a single UMI for a gene. If it's more highly expressed, you're maybe getting um, a few, a handful to maybe like 20 UMIs if it's particularly highly expressed. Yeah, and as Christine mentioned, we and uh, there was a protocol uh, release, uh, released by Broad Institute called uh, a MassSeq. And that is basically, um, is, is working on to increasing the, the throughput four times. Yeah, it looks really cool and we're pretty excited about it um, yeah. because I, I think that'll really help in terms of just the throughput. I agree, I agree. Tichelle, um, when going back now that for, for the autism, the KCNC2 variant, so now that you know it's there, if you go back to the short read data, can you now see it? Or was it not detected at all? Actually, we haven't uh, been able to get the short read data from the clinical center. We just had conversations with them about whether they would have classified it as pathogenic or not. And they said basically KCNC2 is not on the OMIM list yet, um, even though there's a, a preprint that recently came out with lots and lots of cases. Uh, so the answer is we don't know. But we did see it in the 10x data, so that's not quite classical uh, short read, but but we did see it there. So um, yeah, it's a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Christine, uh, for the accuracy comparison, what is the score since the number of clusters are different between long read and short read? Oh, in terms of 72% accuracy, I took the barcode for a single cell in long read, I have a barcode and then a cell type assignment just based on the long read expression. And that, so that same barcode was sequenced or belonged to a bunch of reads in the short read sequencing, which also was assigned to um, 
a cell type. And so if the cell types matched, then we were like, okay, yay, it's accurate. And if it was wrong, then that just that was just wrong. And so that counted against the accuracy. So it was just, it wasn't a scoring system. It was just comparing to see whether the cell types assignments matched uh, between the two different technologies. Okay. For Tichelle, um, if you think about research going forward, would you reflex into hi-fi sequencing sooner instead of having a lot of um, kind of orthogonal uh, methods used first? Uh, for example, 9P syndrome. Yeah, can you, can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so if it would be my preference to just start with long read sequencing data because we can actually get the precise breakpoints for the complex variation. And um, I know it's kind of, kind of come out recently that the methylation tools are now there. So it's interesting that's one of the top genes. I didn't get into all the biology of 9P today because a lot of unpublished stuff, but um, there is one gene in particular that's imprinted. And so actually knowing the methylation status of that gene on the remaining allele is going to be really important. So, I mean, I wish I could do PacBio on everything all the time because it's a lot easier than doing an exome and then doing a genome and then doing long read. You end up spending a lot more money and a lot more time than if you just done the right thing the first time. <laughs> That's my opinion, though. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Christine, can we use, I'm not sure if I say this correctly, uh, API to me workflows, API to me workflows for PacBio. Um, I'm not sure if they are. Maybe they're. I'm uh... not sure either. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I I'm gonna go to uh, another question. Um, what are those genes showing up in short reads as PSA features that are missing in the long reads? Any are there any patterns? Oh, like in a uh, principal components analysis? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, that's actually a really good question. I didn't actually compare um, directly. Um, basically, what I did was Surratt version, I think it was three at the time I analyzed this, has a way to take a reference genome, or sorry, a reference data set um, of cells that have all these different cell type labels and kind of transfer those labels over to cells that looked really similar um, in another data set. So that's what we used um, here. Um, so yes, that does rely on PCA, but I can't say that I've looked at the genes specifically myself. Okay, thank you. And I think we have room for one more question. So this is for Tuchel. I guess that's a bigger question, but uh, going back to the reference databases, are they pro are they projects to increase reference databases for long reads? I mean, I guess you mentioned pan genome. Yeah, so I think the biggest one that I'm aware of is the Human Pan Genome Reference Consortium. This is led, I think, by Dr. Karen Miga and Dr. Adam Philippi. Um, and that is, I think, no, maybe they're the T to T people. Sorry, uh, but anyway, they're um, the same, several yeah. of. The leading yeah. people in the long read area are actually working on this. And I think they're trying to get out to like 300 long read genomes from diverse populations, which is really cool. Um, so that's the one I'm aware of. I've only heard of other ones sort of on the side. I wouldn't know to speak to that. But on the other side, um, in terms of evolutionary things, the vertebrate genome project is actually looking across lots of species which is super cool because that's actually re helping us to refine our looks at conservation and scoring of both coding and non-coding variants. So I think there's a lot of reference stuff going on both in human and non-human. Um, so yeah, very exciting time right now. All right, um, thank you both uh, to Shell and Christine for your time and for sharing your expertise and experience. We are at time, so I'm uh, in closing. I still want to mention uh, three thing briefly, three things. So first, in again, in the next few days, you're going to see an email with a link to recording, and hopefully, we can cut out some of the the, the technical difficulty parts. And um, so, if you at any point that you want to go back um, to listen any part, at any part of the 
um, uh, webinar, you have that link available to you. Second, uh, you can stay up to date on any upcoming webinar, webinars by visiting and bookmarking our packb.com slash events page. And finally, um, immediately after this webinar, you're going to uh, receive a brief questionnaire. Please take two minutes to uh, fill it out because it's really going to help us to uh, better understand your needs and, and how we plan future webinars. So thank you again for joining us today and I hope to, to have you join us again in the future. And with that, take care and have a wonderful day.